I want to look in this study at Moses and his story. We don't have time to do it in all the depth that we would like, but what we see when we look at Moses is a truly great person, a truly great man. In fact, I'm going to put up a suggestion to you that he could be the greatest person in Scripture other than Christ, or the greatest human other than Christ in Scripture. And your mind will say, fair enough, nice suggestion, but you've got to take into account Paul and Abraham and David. There's, there's a fair few to sort of rival him in this. Are, are you certain? Are, are you for real that that's the, 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 the way you want to start this? Yes, it is. So if we look at the titles of Moses, he's called man of God, servant of God, chosen of God, shepherd of God, prophet of God, mediator of God, deliverer of God, lawgiver and king, friend of God, and the one that slips off the bottom is priest of God. There's a whole lot of titles that's given to him. And I can give you these as as notes later if you wish. Um, So he's given all these amazing titles And if you look at that list, there's some pretty impressive things in that list. What did other people make of him? I haven't got too much time to sort of um, wait before I delve straight into the story because there's so much here. But I just want to show you three different views of students that I respect, and that is uh, Brother Thomas. And this is what he said. He was the greatest character the world has ever known with one exception. The world's great ones are not to be named in the same breath. Moses, what meekness, disinterestedness, faithfulness, self-denial, wisdom, knowledge, power, glory, uh, honour, glory and exaltation doth that name represent? I'm sure disinterestedness has a little different meaning today, but you can see that Brother Thomas has a towering respect and sees him as the second greatest. What about um, Robert Roberts? The case of Moses towers over all all others, like a great mountain over the surrounding country. Moses is next to the Lord, the prophet like unto him in height, breadth, importance and greatness of his case in all points and in and relations. Yet all of God and apart from God's use of him, God's word to him and work th- with him, Moses would have lived a quiet pastoral life in Midian. Notice the key word that both of these brethren use. He was the greatest And he towers above all like a great mountain. Greatness is something that both of these brethren state about Moses, Brother Mansfield. And it is is said that history herself was born on the night that Moses led Israel out of Egypt. Before that time, the records of nations are clouded and legend and mystery. But with the emergence of Israel as a nation, they take on clearer form and substance Moses stands out as great even among the great men of the Bible. He is overshadowed only by the Lord Jesus, of whom he is a type. Wow. There's three students who class him as great, exceedingly great. They and I state that he is second only to Christ. That's a pretty big call. But I think what we're going to learn and what we're going to get a glimpse of in this study, which I I feel is really important, is what is true greatness you know we all aspire to something in our lives to some sort of achievement and the world sets its goals before us but what is true greatness that we should be striving for and i think that's demonstrated for us in moses you know um his word alone is seen and as god's word as synonymous with god's word itself he that despiseth moses's law he says in hebrews As Moses commanded, quoting the Old Testament, it is written in the law of Moses. So those phrases talking about Moses' word are talking about God's own word, the Bible. I know this is the process of inspiration, but God's word in his mouth became a law and and Moses' word was synonymous. Here's perhaps even a clearer one. When Moses is read, it doesn't say when the Bible is read, when God's word is read, it says when Moses is read. The law of the Lord, it's called. So there's all these different phrases that describe his, the, God's word in his mouth as being synonymous with greatness and God's word itself. So that's a pretty tall order to start with. And we might look at that and say, what do we care? 
Um, in our own scrabbling lives, we seem to be going on a daily treadmill, we're up the down escalator if you like, where we seem to be putting all our effort into daily tasks merely to exist. But I'm going to put to you that greatness is just the same. Whether you're called to leave Midian or not, whether you're called to do some great deed or whether you exist in everyday life, what we're going to see tonight is this man took 80 years before he really began his mission. Oh, sure, there's some amazing things happened to him in that time, but he didn't rise to greatness for the first 80 years of his life. Milva Perkis has that lovely comment about Jesus where he says Jesus was himself in the carpenter's shop for 30 years and for him the call came to do something more. For, us, for many of us the call never comes. Does that mean we should be different people or should we still strive for greatness in the everyday life that we have to live? Well let's dive into the story and start looking at this man and see what made this true greatness. It's terrible times that they commenced in. The problem is that Egypt has a, has a severe problem with Israelites. Sorry, that slide hasn't come out properly. They have too many Israelites. They're increasing daily. And eventually, if the burden of sheer weight of numbers does overload Egypt, the Israelites will become the rulers and the masters of Egypt. And the Egyptians can see this. Now, we have an amazing insight in this story into the sheer cruelty of human nature. How does a minority group overcome the majority? The Israelites were the majority in terms of numbers. They were growing so fast, the Egyptians were in danger of being overcrowded out of rulership. So what did they do? Well, they developed a very cruel final solution. Their final solution was brutal. And they put pressure on these Israelites to throw out their children to the point that they should not live. So if you can, if you still got Acts, it says in verse 19 of Acts 7, the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their children to the end that they should not live. You know, I don't know if we grasp just how brutal that actually was. You see, this word here where it says that they cast out their young children, Strong says they put out to expose to perish, but it's from a root word meaning to lay out in a passive or horizontal posture. They laid out these children defenceless and on their backs out there for the soldiers to come and kill and throw in the Nile. Basically, this is the state that they've got to. Just, just, it's not pleasant. Just dwell on that for a second. What sort of pressure makes people behave like that with small children? It's got to be extreme. When that quote says they were evil and treated, it must have been severe. You know, our minds goes to Nazi times where they're a web of intrigue and informers and spies, even within their own Jewish ranks bribery and corruption until everyone fears and everyone's looking sideways at everyone else. That's the only way you can get to a point where people give up their own children. Or is it? The world seems to be mad on getting us to give up our own children's morals and to give them over to its hand. So there's dreadful things that are done by the way the world manipulates people. But the response of the Israelites is just pathetic, that they were willing to stoop to that level, that they would abandon not only their own children, but what was the future of their nation. These were truly desperate times. So in these desperate times, a man and a woman stood up and chose to be different from the flow, to go a different direction. That was Amram and Jochebed. Now, if you can see on this chart, we can see the, the line that goes through. We've got uh, Levi up here, and then his descendant, we've got to go through here, Kohath, and then we get Amram. And you can see this, though. He's marrying back a generation to marry his aunt in order to have these children. Why would he do this? Why is there a, a, a going back in the generation? Well, we're told that it had to be the fourth generation. 
Uh, I'll put the slide up, actually, it's probably easier. We've got a lot to cover tonight, so if you wish to turn up the quotes, please do. But Genesis 15 and verse 13, keep a finger in Acts if you wish. We can see here the promise to Abraham was, you remember this is the, the story about the, um, the cutting of the covenant, and there's the walking between the two pieces. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall be afflicted 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge, and afterward they will come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, that thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You know what happened? If we trace through, and we haven't got time to do this, through the genealogies, these Israelites in Egypt had gone past the fourth generation. So many of them gave up on their hope. They gave up on the hope of the promise that had been made to Israel. Acts tells us that the time of the promise drew nigh, Acts 7.17, 7, but the problem was so many of them had gone back be, they'd gone beyond the fourth generation. So it took this faithful uh, husband and wife to, by this arrangement of, of their marriage, this choice in their marriage, to go back a generation. Why did they do that? I believe it's because they had a firm belief in the Abrahamic promises when no one else did. It made them make life choices about their family when everyone else had given up on the hope of Abraham. You know, the amazing thing I find with, um, with Amram is this, is that his Abrahamic faith is recorded for us at the burning bush. Just look carefully. These are the words of the angel at the burning bush. So this is much later in the story. And the angel speaks to Moses and says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Now, read carefully. What is missing in that particular verse? And it's the letter S that you would expect to be on the end of the word father. It's not there. So we, we would expect to have, oops, sorry. We would expect to have here a letter S, the God of thy fathers. I can't do it. But it's the God of thy father, singular. It's Amram's God. That's how patriarchal Amram was that it's not just called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Amram, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how Moses remembered his father. And when here is Moses, remember, he's totally isolated, 40 years of isolation from his own people and his own kindred. And if you wanted to identify and prove to him that this is the God of your father, you say, he's a patriarchal God. And Moses, respect, he knows that it's the God of his father, Amram. How powerful is that? So Amram and Jochebed, I believe, were an incredibly faithful team that decided that they would raise this child. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting thing, and that is that they chose Moses. Um, it says in Acts chapter uh, 7 and verse 20 that um, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Now, the thing is that they've decided to actually choose this particular child to nourish. And the question is this. He's not the firstborn. Why not choose Aaron? Aaron's already been around for a few years. Why did they pick Moses? They've already had two kids before this. What's so special about this child that they decided to pick him? Now, some um, commentators say that there was an angelic visitation, but there's no record of one. So how did they know that this was going to be the child of promise? They've gone down this line of doing this special marriage in order to have the seed of promise, the saviour of the race. How did they know that Moses was it? I think the answer lies in that phrase, he was exceeding fair. It's the Greek theos astius, God beautiful, or as Diaglot renders it, divinely beautiful. Um, and I'm going to suggest to you, though I've got no way of proving it, that Moses looked different, that his appearance set him apart. This is a hard thing. 
So often when someone looks different, they feel that they, sh they automatically are different and better than other people. It, it can affect them their whole life. Um, and how was he different? What, what proof have we got that he was different? Well, nothing concrete, but I will share a humorous story with you at this point. Uh, the Jewish records actually have a humorous story about the great-grandmother of Moses, or great-great-grandmother, um, Sarah. That Sarah was uniquely beautiful. You notice how whenever he goes somewhere, Abraham's quite concerned that his wife will get snapped up. So what was it about Sarah? We're told that she's quite dramatically beautiful, but how? Well, the Jewish story, according to the rabbi, uh, chapter 40, verse 5, it says that um, Abraham, when he went down to Egypt, decided that rather than bringing uh, Sarah in by the front door, he'd sneak her in in a box because she was something to look at. But he was confronted by the customs agents. And at the doorstep of Egypt, they asked him and said, do you have in that box garments? And he said, I will pay the duty on the garments. And they said, really? Um, perhaps you carry precious silks in the box. And Abraham said, I'll pay the, the, the duty price on silks. And then they became very suspicious and they said, perhaps you have precious stones. He said, I'll pay the, the duty on the precious stones. And the custom agents uh, became aware that there was something even more valuable than precious stones in the box and they opened the box and Sarah stepped out and her beauty irradiated the whole of Egypt. Obviously a Jewish version of the story that's a little departure from the facts. Except there must have been something distinctly different about them. And I'm going to suggest that maybe it was a different skin tone. That in the dark coloured races, perhaps there were some that were a very pale skin, a very white skin. And that's just my one suggestion that I can't prove. But it would have explained how the moment they saw the child, they recognised the, the heritage, the genetics of Sarah in the appearance of that child the moment it was born. Because something in the appearance said to them, Abrahamic. It's of the line of the patriarchs. Not only that, you remember when the, um, we're going to get to this in a moment, the daughter of Pharaoh pulls him out of the ark of bulrushes. She takes a look at him and she says, something special about this child also. And she's smitten by this child. Was it that he was white amongst a black-skinned community? I don't know. But there is something distinct about his appearance. So what do they do about this? They've got this child. They know that the fourth generation's here. They know the promises and they're a family that is committed to the Abraham promises. They've got this seed, which they believe is the, the child of promise. Well, they do an incredibly dangerous thing. In a time of intrigue and danger, they spare this child and look after him and bring him through this time and make an ark of bulrushes when he can no longer be hidden and put him out. Uh, sorry, they put him out there on the um, river's brink. Now, I'll just go back to Exodus chapter 2, and I think I've got this on the slide here. I don't. In Exodus chapter 2, it just, the record is there for us. Where it, it, it describes the events. So they've reached this point, this child can no longer be hidden. What are they going to do? Exodus uh, chapter 2 and verse 3. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. There's a teamwork involved here. So it may have been Amram who decided to marry his aunt in order to bring about the godly seed, but she's a faithful woman too. She decides that she's going to make an ark of bulrushes. And as you can see on the slide, the Hebrew word for ark is the same as Noah's ark. This is the only ark we've seen before this in scripture. We actually see some other arks in the story of Moses, and we may get to that later if we have time. It's an ark, and the ark was an item which Hebrews 11 defines as for the saving of a household. Noah built an ark for what reason? being warned of God of things not as seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. 
So that was Noah's motive in making an ark. I, I'm going to suggest to you that this is the same motive that's going on here, that she is doing this for the saving of the household, but the household is the nation of Israel. She's saving the saviour so that he may save the household. There's a similar motive going on. And that's why I think she picks this particular mode of hiding the child. This is why she doesn't just hide him under the bed or stick him in another box like perhaps Sarah had been. She decides to imitate the story of the ark. She even pitches it with pitch. And there's symbology in that, which perhaps we don't have time to go into, that she's copying the ark of Noah, which, as we know, was pitched within and without. Um, but here's the interesting little play that starts to happen. You see in these the two women in this little saga, and there's two different stories in their mind. Here's Jochebed, and in her mind is this little ark for the saving of the household, and it's saved out of the waters. It comes through death and back to life again, as the, the story of the ark is. And she thought that by that, that little story, that little symbology that she's using, she can save the saviour. Do you know, the interesting thing is, there's a fascinating other story that was going on in the mind of the, um, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. Um, there's implications of what she had in her mind. Um, first of all, I will say that where it says in Acts chapter 7, that when he was cast out, I think I've got this on the, on the side, no. When he was cast out, the word for cast out in Acts 7. When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. You are probably remembering that earlier in the chapter, verse 19, the Jews would cast out their children to the end that they might not live. This phrase in the Greek is different. Where it says that Amram and Jochebed had to cast him out, the word has a different meaning. Strong says it means to proclaim or expound. So what she's doing is she's expounding, she's declaring her hope that she's putting her trust in the God who brought Noah through the ark. Okay, now what about the mind of the daughter of Pharaoh? Well, she comes down, it says, to bathe, and she sees this ark there. Now, in the uh, Thompson's land in the book, it tells us that the Egyptians uh, used to use pitch to embalm the dead. This may not have been for the pharaohs, but for the rest of them, they'd get the pitch to embalm the dead. And in fact, the word for ark in the Arabic is the same word as coffin. So through the Egyptian princess's eyes, she sees a coffin. Jochebed sees the ark with the black pitch that saved it, waterproofed it. The daughter of Pharaoh sees the coffin. It's the original word for sarcophagus that's, that's used there. And there's a very different belief that's going on. There's my word cast out that I wanted before. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself in the river, and her maidens walked along by the side, and when, so on and so on. So Rotherham's actually puts this and says, so then the daughter of Pharaoh. So this is not a accidental incident. When we read this as Sunday school students, we think that she just, you know, Jochebed just found a particular place and plonked down the ark, and it just happened by luck to be the same place that the daughter of Pharaoh came along. Just think for a moment how unlikely that is when you've got a river that's infested with crocodiles uh, and, and other nasties, that the daughter of Pharaoh would just swim in any old part of the river. I mean, it's like swimming in the Murray, you don't know what's under there. So there was a particular place, I suggest, marked out for the princess's bathing. And Jochebed actually went there. She knew what was going to, she hoped what was going to happen. She's taking this ark to this particular place. Intriguingly, the word for wash is only ever used of ceremonial bathing. So I'm going to suggest to you that what's in the mind of the princess is that she comes down here with this concept in her mind that she's going to do her religious ceremonial bathing. And you may think of the Indians with the Ganges River, how they go down there and they have their ceremonial water, watering time in the, in the river, that there's a link between the people and the gods, as they believe it, of that particular river. 
And for the Egyptians, the Nile was very much a god in their belief system. So she's coming down to um, worship by washing, in a way. And it says then that she opened the little ark up, she sees the child, the babe wept, she compassion on him, and she said, this is one of the children of the Hebrews. So it seems that she's in a religious frame of mind, because she sees this child, she's smitten by his appearance, she knows he's a Hebrew, perhaps she could tell because he was circumcised, but she knows he's a Hebrew, and now she goes on to give him a name, and the name she gives him is Moses. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, Moses in the Egyptian simply means a son. But Moses uh, is, and, and that was a common name in the Egyptian tongue. They had Ah Moses, Ramoses. Uh, they all have Moses in it, which means son of Ah or son of Ram. But in the Hebrew, and she's picked the Hebrew meaning of the name, it means to draw out. And she explains that this is the meaning she's taking on board. Uh, if you've got Exodus chapter 3, the child grew and she brought him, to Pharaoh, uh, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she called his name Moses and she said, because I drew him out of the water. She's picking up on the Hebrew name being drawn out of the water. What's going on here? There must be something deeper happening in this particular story. Well, there is. There's a massive mythology that befuddled the minds of Egyptians. And uh, I don't know if you want to read it all on the, on the thing there, but Wikipedia describes the story. In the mythology, the evil god Set took the greatest god, Osiris, and tricked him into getting into a box. They had a party. There was a challenge put out. Anyone who fits the box perfectly can keep it. And it's got some lovely gold and gems on it. And so eventually Set, the evil one, managed to trick Osiris into taking on the bet and he climbs into the box at which time Set jams it shut, seals it with lead and throws the thing into the Nile. And that was the original idea of the sarcophagus. So the sarcophagus of, of, of the jeweled um, coffin was originally from this particular story. Well, the idea is that Osiris actually died uh, and in, in the, the process, he also somehow gets torn in pieces, but that's, that's another part of the story. He dies in this particular coffin, and the coffin floats for some time and finishes up being embedded in a tree trunk. And the wife of Osiris, it's all mythology, children, if anyone's listening, total rubbish. Don't go home and, and say this is anywhere in the Bible, because it's not. Uh, the, the wife uh, finds, goes out mourning to find her dead husband. And she finds this tree that had the sarcophagus inside it has finished up being made into a pillar in Byblos on the Phoenician coast. So she manages to remove this coffin out of the pillar, which is the tree, and open the coffin, and there's her dead husband, dismembered. Uh, and then she uses spells, which she learnt from her father, to bring him back to life. So the idea was that the dead husband was drawn out of the waters... Of the, of the river and out of the sarcophagus the sarcophagus was then opened and then the, the, the daughter the, the wife gave life to this particular um, dead body and that then became the son this is actually the origin the Egyptian version of the original Trinity story the Trinity story is not Father, Son and Holy Spirit it's Father, Son and Mo Mother and this is one variant on it. Every different country and every different pagan belief seems to have their own variant. But this is the Egyptian version. The Egyptian version was that the, the, the wife of Pharaoh, and the weird thing is, they had their daughters as ceremonially their wives. So this was the wife and daughter of Pharaoh. She went down to the Nile and she found a coffin and she opened it and out comes the son... And according to the mythology, that's the next pharaoh. This is the only way she's going to have children. This is the only way she's going to have any claim or heir to the throne is by having this mythological son. And the Egyptians are going to accept this because it fits the mythology and maybe because he looked divinely beautiful. 
So there's this whole mythology that's going through her mind, which is completely different to what jacobed has got going through her mind, and God allows this story to miraculously, these two different stories, one of the, of the story of Noah's Ark and one of this warped, stupid mythology that the Egyptians had to come together for the saving of the Saviour. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And look, if you want to talk to me more about that later, it really goes outside the story of what we want to know about to talk about Egyptian mythology. But it is quite fascinating to see how using the foolishness, the mythology of Egypt, God saves the saviour by using that, that weird and wonderful story. So that, But it does explain for me also why on earth does this woman open this box, look at this child and say, that's going to be the next pharaoh. I mean, seriously, she should have said, oh, next soldier, please can you uh, kill this baby and throw it back in the Nile? That should have been the normal response to finding a Hebrew child, shouldn't it? And this is not just different, <laughs> it's completely different. You're going to make him the next pharaoh? I mean, really? Because that's what the title, you remember in Hebrews, that he's given the title of son of Pharaoh's daughter. And that's what that title is implied implied you are the next pharaoh because the mythology said that's how the line of the pharaohs is propagated is that the daughter acquires someone who's going to be the son and he then becomes the next pharaoh it's very weird and and perhaps if you want to dig into it deeper but don't dig into it too far because there's some really rubbishy things in egyptian mythology that are not worth it so we have this miraculous incidents where the saviour is saved by a faithful woman who remembers life out of death for Noah and his family and the saving of a household. And God uses the mythology of the foolish Egyptians to work with that and bring it to pass. So Moses grew and he became a man who was mighty in word and in deed. He grew in wisdom and deeds and words Acts 7.22, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So here we've got this uh, growth of this man to be uh, a giant in, in even the Egyptian circles. Uh, we don't know ex much about Moses because, of course, the history doesn't necessarily pinpoint who he actually is. But there's been some suggestions of a particular person in history who may be Moses and it seems that he um, won great expeditions in Ethiopia. He actually was a mighty military leader at one point. And so some have suggested that that is actually Moses. That when it says he became mighty in words and deeds, it's quite possible that he did actually run military campaigns on behalf of the Egyptians. But at the end of 40 years, it says that he refused all that Egypt had to offer. And this is this dramatic moment in what we've got to consider tonight, where this man who'd been given so much, he'd be, he was heir to the very throne of Pharaoh, the greatest kingdom of the time that he lived in. He was the heir of all that he surveyed. He turned his back on the lot. Uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 22 said that uh, by faith Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now this is quite an incredible little quote. You see how he refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter. That was a title. That was a specific title that he was given. And to the Egyptians... Titles were very important. Um, the Egyptian elite actually saw titles as an achievement. Um, apparently, archaeologists have been stunned by the length of the titles. It's not like you know some of these professors got you know all these letters after their name. They had all these massive, big, long titles. So on, on the tomb, you might find that this particular person is Lord Architect and Scribe to the Most Glorious Leader of, and on and on and on they go. So the Egyptians were very fond of their titles, but there was one you couldn't buy. And that was next Pharaoh. Because that could only be by this mythological descent process. And Moses had it. You, you know, some people, they, they earn their career in life and they choose to give it up for the truth. But this one was 
given to him as a one-off. There's no one else with that sort of title. Um, he gave up all the pleasures of sin for a season. And the Egyptians were well known for that. They used to be married at the first possible opportunity. That marriage in Egyptian times could happen as young as 13. And there's no indication that Moses married until the time of Midian. Perhaps he was aware that if he was going to be the saviour of the nation, he didn't want to put at risk a wife or ch children. Um, he gave up the pleasures of Egypt and history records, or, or the archaeologists find that Egypt was no different to what we have today. Sure, maybe they didn't actually have electronic lights, but the parties, there was definitely the nightclub lifestyle where only the attractive could enter the door, where Im immorality was the name of the game and alcohol flowed extremely freely. You know, it's all of those things that he chose to give up that could have been his. He could have been the life of the party. Oh, and he gave up the treasures of Egypt. Now, the treasures of Egypt are still renowned today. Uh, casinos are named Pharaoh's Palace and things like this. There's the Pharaoh's Place. Why? Because synonymous with Pharaoh is wealth and gold. The two ideas of an Egyptian Pharaoh and gold go hand in hand. And he had all of that for the asking. He just turned his back on all of those things. He could have had a pyramid that lasted for thousands of years in his name. That people in 2,000 years after Christ could still see the evidence of a Pharaoh called Moses. It could have happened for him. And he gave the whole lot up. What for? Well, it's to be part of the people of God. People of God, they were a disorganised rabble of slaves. They didn't really follow God at all. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 7 and 8, if you want to note it, said that they would not listen to God, but worshipped the idols of Egypt that God detested. So they're slaves, they're a rabble, and they worship idols. And that's who he decided to align himself with. So he starts out on this bold plan to free, him, free the nation from the Egyptian scourge. And it's a two-stage plan. I, I'm going to suggest to you that I think it's linked to this idea that he is a man of great word and deed, as we were told in Acts. What is this plan that he has? Well, he's mighty in word and in deed. So I suggest that the first step he takes is he has to show himself to Israel and prove himself to Israel as being mighty indeed. So what he does is he goes out and kills the Egyptian. And you know the story? When he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. And our Sunday school version of that, we sort of remember that, you know, there's um, uh, Moses just happens to be walking along and his heart goes out in compassion to this poor slave who's crying out under the impression of a slave master's whip. And perhaps that's how we picture it or tell the story in Sunday school. But that's not really very logical. Would that be the only occurrence that Moses had ever seen the oppression of his people? Had he not seen this before? You know, this oppression was something that went on day after day by the thousands. It's nothing new. But Moses is choosing this particular incident. I think he actually strategically picked this. Maybe this was, in some senses, an act of anger. Maybe he did do a mighty and dramatic thing that, to kill a man with his fists in one blow or something dramatic like that. But I think it's strategic. I think what he's trying to do is to send a message. The message is that he is a potential leader for Israel that is mighty indeed in action. So that message would have gone through the shanty towns and the hovels that the Israelites lived in that night. There's, there's a new leader on the block. There's someone out there who's mighty in his deeds. His name's Moses. He's not afraid. He'll stand up to the Egyptians. This is how you start a rebellion. Perhaps what Moses is trying to do is to stir up the Israelites behind him. He wants to be a leader by what method? 
by the methods that mankind chooses. He's learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and I think at his first attempt to save the nation, that's the wisdom he's trying to use. He goes out there and shows himself militarily to be a mighty man indeed. And then he goes out and says, right now, the next incident, he's going to be mighty in word, in logic, in justice. So you look in, if you've still got Acts open there, you can look at verse 25, where he supposed that his brethren would have understood that by his hand he would deliver them, but they understood not. The next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one, saying, Sirs, ye be brethren, why do you wrong one another? So the word showed is, is kind of odd. It, it's, it, it indicates that he actually made a formal presentation. This is, this is his time to present himself as their deliverer. So stage two, he's going to fix the offence. He's going to resolve Israelite disputes. He's going to show them that not only can he be a mighty leader to defeat the Egyptians, but he can be a good judge, a good mediator and a, and a peacemaker and a wise leader by his words inside the nation. He thought that they knew why he had kept himself separate all this time. He thought that they would have understood what an opportunity he'd given up, the opportunity of being Pharaoh. He thought that they shared the same hopes of Abraham. He thought that they wanted to reject idols, but they didn't. The problem was they realised that this sort of leader was going to have an implication for them personally. They were now going to be subjected to justice, and they didn't want it. And they rejected him along with it. And they said to him, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? There's the objection. You might be, he's trying to present himself as someone who can lead a rebellion over the Egyptians. And they're saying, that may be fine. We're happy to have a, a great warrior, but not someone who judges us. You can't tell me what to do. And there's the flaw in the Jewish nation at that time. And Moses hadn't seen it. And when he sees it, he up and flees. He has to run for his life. There's nothing else he can do. You see, if he stays where he is and goes into the palace, he's a dead man. So it says he fled to Midian and there begat two sons. If he'd tried to hide amongst the shanties of the Israelite town, for a few more leeks and garlics, they would have ratted him out to the Egyptians. If he went brazenly back into the, into the palace and pretended nothing had happened, it wouldn't be long before, for a few leeks and garlics, they would have ratted him out to the Egyptians. He had no choice. He knew that if he presented, if, if Pharaoh saw him and realised that he was trying to raise a rebellion, the whole work that Pharaoh was trying to do was to get rid of these Israelites because they could have overwhelmed the nation. He couldn't stand for it. If he was going to go through all these years of draconian oppression of the Israelites... He couldn't stand up for a new rebel leader. He had to be rid of him. He was a dead man. So he up and flew and went to Midian. Now I'm going to suggest to you that the next 40 years are a depressing time for Moses. He, I think, loses the plot a little bit. And this is kind of encouraging for some of us who go through tough times where we think we know what we should be doing. And we charge in and we do it our way. And we find it's not God's way. We have to learn that lesson, and so did Moses. He thought that because he was wise in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and deed, that he would have been the rebel leader they were looking for. But no, it didn't work out that way. I'm going to put to you that he actually went through a severe time of depression, and there's some symptoms. Um, first of all, there's a speech impediment that took over him, that perhaps long time out in the paddocks with the sheep, he failed to spend enough time speaking and became someone of slow tongue, at least believing himself to be slow tongue. So someone who trained in all the wisdom originally in his first 40 years of his life may even have been a great speaker, an orator, trained in the wisdom of the Egyptians, now became a person of slow tongue, a person who spoke little or even had a speech impediment as he seems to believe in Exodus chapter 4. He's very reluctant to marry. He didn't actually marry for some time. Um, 
You know, it doesn't read that way in the King James. It says in Exodus 2 that Moses was content to dwell with the man and he gave him Zipporah, his daughter. The word for content is not the same word that we think of in English. It means to yield because of weakness, to give in. I think he thought that he was going to be the saviour and therefore he should not marry because he had to have both hands free to, to save the nation and be the great warrior leader. But now he gives in and marries and settles down to the life that seems to have come upon him. He's very late in starting a family. And my proof for this is Exodus chapter 4 verse 20 where at the end of the 40 years in Midian it says that he put his wife and his two sons on the ass and rode them back towards Egypt. All right. So uh, anyone got a 15 year old here? They suddenly get a lot larger at a certain age in life. So if these children, he's been 40 years, he's now 80, if he had these children early-ish in his 40 year stay in Midian, that would have been one tired donkey by the time it got there. It may have broken down before it got too far down the road. Those boys would have been too big. My point is this, those children were still pretty young at the end of the 40 years for the mum and two kids to ride one donkey. They can't have been teenagers or young men. Oh, and there's this very telling point. There's the name that he gives his son. So he gives his son this name here, Gershom. And she bare him a son and called his name Gershom, for she said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. That's an incredible name to name you. It means refugee. It's from a word meaning expulsion, to be thrown out to make a refugee. I mean, how's that for a kid's name? I think we'll think of a nice name for our kid. How about refugee? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really bode well for indicating how he fitted in in Midian. Perhaps he never tried to be part of the social scene in Midian. And when everyone else was getting to know each other, there was Moses staring off towards Egypt in the distance. And Zipporah, who wished that she could get closer to him, felt that she was missing out on some vital part of what made Moses who he really was. So it's at this point that something dramatic happens. Um, and I will take you back to Exodus chapter 3 here for this. We have the saga of the burning bush, which I'm going to suggest, and hopefully I can spend some time and prove this to you later, is an absolute turning point in his life. Exodus chapter 3, I think he's at a, a lowest possible ebb. And it makes this little point. He's not just a shepherd, but it says in this weird way, Exodus chapter 3, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. I don't remember, someone could correct me, but I don't remember anywhere else it being called the backside of the desert. What's being implied by that, I suggest, is a very downcast man feeling he's hiding in the backdrop. He's definitely the person who's sitting in the back row with their head down, hoping no one will notice him. He's definitely in a depressed state in, from the way I read that particular verse. And it's in this downcast state that the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burnt with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And so he has this meeting where in verse 6, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses was a, uh, hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. So this is Moses' final confrontation. Final, sorry, not final. But finally, after all these years, there's this appearance of the God of his father. And here's an indicator as to what you've done wrong, Moses. Here's where you've got the story wrong. If you've got Exodus chapter 3, look at this. And Yahweh said, I have seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them. See the, see the point? The point he's driving at is Moses is, it's not about you. It's my people. 
You thought that you would do this by Moses' hand. You've forgotten. I will do this. You may be involved, but I will do this. It is my work. Just, um, um, I'll put up on the slide here another quote. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So Moses had thought that he was the great leader. Now he's completely depressed and he thinks, yes, but now I'm a nobody. He's gone the swings and roundabouts of life, have gone completely the other way. And he's unable to see that he's got any strength to do anything. And God says, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. Moses again said unto God, Behold, when I came unto the children of Israel, and should say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is perhaps the biggest point out of our study tonight. And that is that it's not by our own might that anything is really achieved. It's by teamwork with God. It's by working together with God. Moses thought that he could achieve the rebellion to bring the nation out by his own hand. And God says, you're not going to achieve it that way. That was never the way the Saviour was going to work. It's going to be my victory through the Saviour. So now he gives him a series of different signs to drive home this lesson. And perhaps we'll finish on these signs tonight. The first one is, of course, the burning bush itself. So the burning bush, it says, certainly I will be with thee. And this is, or this shall be, uh, a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people of it out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So what is the, the, the token that's being described in this particular chapter? And I think I've written down Exodus chapter 2 and it's, it's not. Um, it's the burning bush itself. But you see in that verse, it says, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. What's the token a symbol of? Thou? Or the people brought out of Egypt? And I'm suggesting to you, it's both. That Moses himself could not be destroyed. He would be like that burning bush because God would be in him. So Moses felt downcast, and sometimes we feel downcast in our own lives. And we look at ourselves and question whether we have the strength and the ability to go on. And the answer God gives is, I will. I will be in you, and you will be like a burning bush. Pharaoh cannot touch you, because if God is in you, nothing can destroy you and the plan that I have with you. And therefore, also, your presence will be as if it is my presence in the nation of Israel. And Israel also cannot be destroyed. The next thing he shows him is the serpent rod. And he takes this rod, throws it down. It was the typical tool of the shepherd, something that he'd spent 40 years holding. He'd become accustomed to it, this life, of carrying around this stick and using it to herd sheep around the place. It was something that he could manage even in his depression. And he throws it down, and it becomes a serpent, and it scares the daylights out of him. And he flees away from this snake. He runs away from it. And God tells him and says, take courage, go and pick it up. Now, that's an amazing ask. He tells him to go and do something that seems incredibly dangerous and impossible. And when he does, he reaches out and picks it up. It turns back into being a harmless rod again in his hand. What do we think the lesson is? Well, I think Moses still doubts himself. But what he's told is that he needs to obey God's instruction. And even Pharaoh, the serpent king, can be held in his grasp and be as much in control by his hand as the humble shepherding job that he was currently doing. That's my suggestion as to what that symbol actually means. And so God was giving him hope that he would be with him to make him do things that he was scared of, that he was afraid to do. And God says, I'll be with you. And it will be just as much in your control 
as this humble shepherding job. But there's a couple of warning signs as well. There's the leprous hand. Put the hand into the bosom, it came out as white as snow. Put the hand back, and when you draw it out again, it will be healed as good as the other. The hand put inside the bosom is apparently a symbol of lethargy or in laziness, inactivity. And there's a disease of inactivity, but God can heal it. You know, this is a lesson to Moses, who has almost given up on the hope, and he's spending those 40 years in, in Midian doing nothing, and appeared that he was going to carry on doing nothing for the rest of his life. And God says, it's inactivity, but I can heal it. If you work with me, but also the nation of Israel, they're stuck in idolatry, inactivity, and they've given up hope, but I can heal that problem says God. But if they do reject me, then there's one final sign, and that is of the blood water poured out on the ground. And this water was poured out. It's a symbol of the peoples. The peoples were symbolized by the Nile River. If the people of Israel were just going to be just another people of this world, and they wouldn't hear, then they'd be poured out as blood on the ground. And the only other place I can think of as blood poured out on the ground earlier in, in the Genesis record is when they were to kill the animals. And the sign was that there's a pointless waste of life. And mankind had to have impressed on him that this death was a disgraceful waste, if you like, a wicked waste, as some people say. And if the nation of Israel was not going to listen and they were going to say that they, they don't want to know God, they just want to be just another people, then in the end it would be such a sad waste. I had thought to cover some more on the road back to Egypt, but I'll save that for next time. What I want you to realise out of this particular story is that we're 80 years in. We're 80 years in before this man learns the secret of true greatness. The secret of true greatness is I will. We try to do things in our own might, and when we fail, we sometimes get depressed. We sometimes give up and go off to Midian, but... Don't be depressed. Don't give up. What we're taught is that God is with us. We've been called to this life that we're here for. We've been called to do something for the household of God, to try and be, in our own little way, saviours. You may never be called to go out and do something dramatic, but true greatness is to allow God to work in your life and in my life, that we can do something for the saving of our household and never give up.